Now, why is it so difficult to treat these Borrelia infections? What's actually going on? Well, we have to again go back to the basics. The Borrelia growth patterns. In Lyme Borrelia, not the relapsing fever Borrelia, but the Lyme Borrelia, there's a distinct four-week cycle of disease activities. Patients will say, we have good and bad days. I talked about this yesterday. Now, this is what happens in the Borrelia. There's a period of growth, then there's a period of latency or dormancy where they stop growing. Then they grow again, and then they stop. In Lyme Borrelia, it's about a four-week cycle. In the relapsing fever Borrelia, it can be two to four weeks, sometimes three weeks. It turns out that antibiotics kill bacteria during their growth phase. So if you have a bacterium that doesn't grow steadily like most do, but one like this that like relapses, relapsing fevers, you have a growth and a latent period. So if you use a treatment that doesn't bracket one whole growth cycle of four weeks, you're going to have a failure. So having this pattern and recognizing it is the key to your treatment of a Lyme patient. Okay, so again, I've said this before and I'll say it again. I'll probably say it even more. The four-week cycle is so important. You must have your patients keep a diary. The other thing about Borrelia growth is that they grow very slowly. And it's a basic fact that the slower the growth of an organism, the longer it takes to kill them. That's why we treat tuberculosis for months, in some cases years, um, as opposed to staph or strep, which is a matter of days to weeks. The other things that Borrelia do that affect treatment is that they affect, in a negative way, our immune system. The Borrelia infection is immunosuppressive in mammals. Um, they will not only cause a dysfunction of the B and T cells, they'll actually kill some of them. And as we know, they prevent the maturation of CD56 killer cells into CD57, and that's the basis of the CD57 test, which is depressed when Lyme has been active for a long time. Another thing that is very unique to Borrelia is that it causes a defect in signals from the B cells. Normally, our immune system has what's called an innate immunity, um, which um, is kind of a background immune system that's there to protect us from the very basic attack. After whatever is attacking us, the virus or bacteria are there for a period of time, we get what's called an adaptive immunity, which recognizes specifically what's going on. So the innate immunity, which is signaled by B cells, is supposed to shut down and allow this adaptive immunity to take over. There's a defect in this process in Lyme disease. The B cells don't turn off. So the innate immune system is constantly activated and that is why we have this upregulation of cytokines, the inflammatory mediators. Well, Dr. Maharitz will talk more about that later. And the anti-inflammatory cytokines are turned down. Um, one of the immunologists I've, I've worked with has called this not an autoimmune phenomenon, but an auto-inflammatory process. Another thing that happens with Borrelia is what's called epitope switching. The genes of Borrelia are very complex. Some of them are, are turned on and some of them are turned off at any one point in time. But as the Borrelia go through their growth cycles and their latent cycles, different genes will turn off and on. And that causes the surface of the Borrelia to change. That's why the symptoms change. That's why there's a relapsing cycle. Um, but it also means that the immune system, when it finally adapts to this Borrelia after a few weeks and starts to mount the immune attack, the Borrelia genes switch the surface and now the body sees a new surface to the body. It's a new germ, and the old one is gone. So the immune system has a hard time catching up and getting this infection under control. So the uh, adaptive immunity has a hard time keeping up. The Borrelia, in addition, have a lot of survival strategies. And you think about it. First of all, this bug has been around longer than us on this planet, I'm sure. And it can live in lizards, bugs, mammals, birds. So it has to be able to adapt. Now, we know, and we've seen from Dr. McDonald's work, Dr. Lane's work, that the Borrelia can shift from spiral forms, which have cell walls, to cell wall deficient forms, the L forms, and they can even form cysts, which are protective. The important thing to know from a clinical point of view is that each of these three forms has different antibiotic susceptibilities. So one medication that might work, for example, for the spiral form may not work for the other two. And that's one of the reasons why combination treatments are given. I'll show you that in a moment. The other thing is that Borrelia can sequester themselves deep into tissues and inside collagen bundles, inside the Achilles tendon, for example, far away from the immune system, far away from the effect of antibiotics. That's why lower doses of medications are prone to failure, and medications that don't penetrate well will not give you a successful outcome. Borrelia are among the very few uh, bacterium that can survive inside our cells. Now, if you have a, a normal situation, um, the bacteria get engulfed by our immune cells, and in the process of being engulfed, they're digested and they're killed. Borrelia will stay inside the cells and not be killed. 
So that's a way for them to survive attack and also a way for them to be disseminated because the blood cells travel throughout the body, they carry the Borrelia. And the final thing is that, um, as you heard before, and you'll hear much more today, the Borrelia produce a protective biofilm. And the biofilm is like a gelatinous coating around the bacterium that prevents antibiotics and immune factors from getting to the, bug, the bugs to kill them.